Thank you all for joining this discussion meeting on the next steps in nuclear arms control. Uh, normally when we have discussion meetings on subjects like this, we like to get uh, a couple of different speakers uh, who represent different points of view, uh, get some uh, debate and, uh, and contrast on the panel itself. We didn't exactly do that this time. Uh, we have uh, uh, speakers and the chairman, all who come from uh, the same uh, background of having been socialized uh, through the U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, we're all centrists in our uh, perspective and in our outlook. Um, but we do have uh, uh, some points of view, and uh, that will become apparent. But for the real clashes, we will be looking to you all uh, in the audience. Um, you know, I was thinking we could have had somebody uh, here who, um, in contrast to the uh, recommendations that uh, uh, Steve Pfeiffer will be making about uh, the opportunities for arms control, we could have somebody like Eric Edelman, who in his uh, blurb in uh, recommending people read Steve's book, starts off saying, notwithstanding my disagreement with many of the recommendations, uh, but then he goes on to say why this is an important book. Um, Steve is going to be talking uh, to some of the recommendations and to some of the, uh, the opportunities uh, ahead in the arms control um, agenda for the uh, Obama administration and for, for Russia. He's an expert uh, on the subject of arms control and on Russia. He is a, a former Foreign Service officer, as I said. I first met him when he was the deputy director of the then Soviet desk uh, back in the uh, 1980s, and his Foreign Service career focused a lot on that part of the world. Uh, and he, um, in one of his, maybe it was his last posting, was ambassador uh, to the Ukraine. He now is director of the Brookings Arms Control Initiative, um, and uh, he's, uh, he's written on, on the subject of arms control and is frequently quoted uh, in the press. Uh, and, uh, joining us to uh, give a commentary on Steve's uh, presentation is, is Ted Say, who's based here in London. Uh, he came to the United Kingdom after retiring from the, former, uh, from the Foreign Service in 2000. Uh, and uh, 11, uh, his last position was with the U.S. Uh, NATO, where he was an advisor uh, on arms control. Previously, he had been at the Wassenaar Agreement, uh, seconded there, um, dealing with conventional uh, arms uh, control. So that could also be a subject if it's of interest during the discussion. Uh, I won't say too much more, just uh, except that I'm really delighted that Steve and Ted could come here and provide a, a better um, exploration of this topic than I gave when I spoke to it uh, at a discussion meeting on January 31st when I was, ex I was talking about um, Obama's agenda. And um, I guess I was pretty pessimistic about the, the prospects. I was talking about the, uh, on, it seemed like on every front uh, on Obama's nuclear agenda, he faced <coughs> difficulties uh, with the fissile material cutoff treaty. Pakistan was blocking it. Uh, with um, the next arms control agreement and a missile um, defense agreement, uh, Putin did not seem to be uh, inclined to go along. With um, comprehensive test ban treaty uh, ratification, the U.S. Senate uh, was an obstacle. But, um, Steve, I had a chance to read um, not all of but the key parts of your book last night, and um, I'm glad that you have a, a bit more optimistic uh, and positive-looking perspective. So. Uh, tell us, uh, tell us why you are. Okay, great. Well, Mark, uh, first of all, thanks very much for moderating this, and uh, thanks to Jenny Nielsen for organizing it. Um, uh, the book that um, Mike and I wrote, uh, we finished it last summer. Uh, I still retain a degree of optimism, though I'm perhaps not as optimistic as we might have been last July. But I do think that there are opportunities for uh, the Obama administration and the Russians to do some things in the next several years. Uh, although a lot is going to depend upon what happens and what decisions are taken in Moscow. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. But let me just start by showing where things are now, the starting point. Uh, these are the limits in the New START Treaty. Uh, I think the, the first and the third limits are the most important. Uh, 700 deployed strategic delivery vehicles. That's basically intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launch ballistic missiles that are in silos or are in missile tubes on submarines that literally can be launched within a matter of minutes. Uh, and I think that third limit there, 1,550 deployed strategic warheads, is what I consider the most important one, because I think what comes down in this case is probably more important than what goes up. 
Now, I, this is a bit of arms control math here in that 1550 limits the actual number of warheads on American and Russian strategic ballistic missiles. But for bombers, each bomber counts as only one in that 1550. And that continues the tradition of arms control of preferential treatment for bombers, largely based on the fact that it takes a bomber eight to 10 hours to reach a target, whereas ballistic missiles can reach targets in 15 to 20 minutes. But these limits are uh, in the treaty. Uh, the treaty entered in force in 2011, and these limits take full effect in 2018. Uh, and certainly that represents uh, progress. It, it's an improvement on uh, the START-1 treaty. It's certainly an improvement on the 2002 Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty. But I think um, you know, 20 years after the end of the Cold War, 20 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you have to ask the question, do these numbers still really make sense? And I think uh, for President Obama, he would actually like to do more. Uh, it's clear, particularly from things that he said several years ago, that he would like to leave behind a legacy of significant nuclear reductions. <clears throat> and my guess is that he does not see the New START Treaty by itself as, as, as being that legacy. So if you go further, uh, what sorts of questions do you have to look at in terms of nuclear reductions? Well, one would be, should that next reduction round be bilateral or should it be multilateral? Uh, some in Moscow say it's time to go to a multilateral approach. And I wouldn't exclude doing something multilateral, but it seems to me that even when you get to 2018 and get to these numbers, the United States and Russia are still going to maintain between 90 and 95 percent of the nuclear weapons in the world. So I would still see a rationale for a primary emphasis on one more bilateral U.S.-Russia round. Now, at the same time, you could do some multilateral, and I think there's, there's a, the P5 uh, uh, process going on now, which is talking about things like terminology, and maybe Washington and Moscow might push that a bit and see if you could get, for example, Britain, France, and China to, to show some transparency uh, or maybe even go as far as to take on a unilateral commitment not to increase in order to create conditions that would facilitate U.S. and Russian reductions. But I think that's a first question that have to be worked out. The second question is, then, do you stay with limits on deployed strategic weapons as you have in New START, or do you expand that to capture other types of weapons? Uh, this shows U.S. and Russian nuclear warhead levels. This is from the Federation of American Scientists, and that top line deployed strategic is, is what's now governed by New START. I, I should explain the asterisk there. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm not using New START counting rules. Uh, in this case, the 1950 on the American side includes about 300 air-launched cruise missiles and bombs that are believed to be stored at air bases for use by U.S. strategic bombers. So it's a, it's a different counting rule than the treaty per se. But this also brings in non-strategic weapons, where the Russians have a significant numerical advantage, and non-deployed or reserve strategic weapons, where the United States has a very significant advantage. The U.S. military basically wanting to maintain at least one reserve strategic warhead for every deployed warhead, both as a hedge against geopolitical surprise but also as a hedge against technical war, uh, technical failure in a warhead type that they can then switch something out. Uh, but I think I would argue that it's now time to go beyond just deployed strategic and begin to address some of these other types of weapons. Uh, certainly uh, in the U.S. Senate and on the part of American allies in Central Europe, there's a desire to get at the Russian advantage in non-strategic or tactical weapons. And I think in Moscow, uh, there is some concern on the part of the Russian military regarding this imbalance in reserve strategic weapons. Now, if you look at next steps and reductions, uh, I can see a couple of paths that you might proceed down. One is what I call the big treaty, and when, when Mike and I wrote about it, what we recommended was that the next negotiation aim for a treaty that would limit all U.S. and Russian nuclear weapons, deployed, non-deployed, strategic, non-strategic, everything except those weapons that are retired in the dismantlement queue. And there's about 4,500 to 5,000 weapons in each side stockpile, and what we recommended was a total limit on each side of 2,000 to 2,500. And then within that, you would have a sublimit of 1,000 deployed strategic warheads. So you'd take that 1550 number in New START, bring it down to 1,000, and you'd want to constrain those, again, because those are the weapons that are most readily usable that can be launched in some cases in a matter of minutes. Uh, we would recommend then reducing the 700 limit on deployed missiles and bombers down to about 500. That's a number that would still allow each side to maintain a triad if it thought that it was important. And I think in the American side, that still uh, has, is seen as having value. But the aggregate limit, that limit of 2,000 to 2,500, what it does is it forces the side to make a trade-off. And, and basically, it forces the U.S. to reduce its advantage in reserve strategic weapons. Uh, that's in the, uh, the yellow bar there. 
and the Russians to reduce their advantage in non-strategic weapons. That's in the, used to be orange, and this uh, it looks like it's the pink bar. But getting under 2,000, so basically that aggregate limit forces the side, it's the mechanism to force the sides to reduce their advantages. Now, at the end of the day, the Russians might still have within the 2,000 limit more tactical weapons, and the Americans might still have more reserve strategic weapons, but that would be a matter of choice. And, and what this agreement would do is it would require each side to reduce their arsenals by about 50 percent, uh, but it would still leave the United States and Russia each with maybe six to seven times as many weapons as the nearest third country. So there would still be clearly two nuclear superpowers. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, when I talked to people in the administration, I, I think they were thinking on lines of this, this idea of, of a treaty that would address all weapons and perhaps end that distinction between strategic, non-strategic, deployed, non-deployed. Um, and certainly there were some, some interesting leaks that came out about two months ago that said the administration, in the uh, follow-up to the nuclear posture review, the implementation study, was looking at a level of 1,000 to 1,100 deployed strategic weapons and a level of 2,500 to 3,500 total nuclear weapons. But I think there's a little bit of concern in the administration now whether this big treaty approach, whether they would actually have time to do it. Because you're going to be addressing new classes of weapons, new verification issues, and if you want to have a treaty that you can submit to the Senate, you've got to have it done by 2015 because you don't want to have a treaty go to the American Senate during an election year. And the question is, would there be time to do it? And I think there's some concern now in the administration that they might not have time to accomplish that. So an alternate approach uh, might be, and this, this came out of a track two discussion uh, that Brookings does with Madeleine Albright and Igor Ivanov, would be um, perhaps parallel tracks, that you have one track that would address deployed strategic weapons, and the second track would address reserve strategic and non-strategic. And your track on deployed strategic weapons could be very simple. It could be just take the New START number, the New START treaty, and change the numbers. Change 1550 to 1000, change 700 to 500, change 800 down to maybe 600. Uh, you might have to stretch out some of the dates, but your definitions, your counting rules, your verification measures will all apply. So it could be a fairly straightforward and fairly easily done. The second track would address reserve strategic and then non-strategic or tactical weapons. And I think it's important to keep those two clumps of weapons in the same track because you have a Russian numerical advantage in one and an American numerical advantage in the other, and that creates a trade-off possibility. But what that track might be, it might be slower, it might be phased. So you start off with transparency, some basic confidence-building measures, then some more, uh, some other confidence-building measures, perhaps with some monitoring. And then at the end, in the, in the third or fourth phase, you end up with an actual negotiation aimed at numerical limits. Uh, but the question is going to be is that you have a track there that is probably going to be longer than the track that it would take to revise the uh, numbers for deployed strategic weapons. Uh, this is assuming that the Russians want to engage on this. And, and that may be an issue in, in the United States. What is the interdependence between these two tracks? I think certainly in terms of some in the American Senate, the further you are along on that second track in terms of getting towards limits on non-strategic weapons and reserve strategic weapons, the more comfortable they may be in supporting a, an amendment of the uh, New START Treaty. Uh, I guess I'd make one last observation about confidence-building measures. Um, I think there's a lot of potential here looking at non-strategic or tactical weapons, but one of the challenges, it seems to me, is that a lot of the confidence-building measures, for example, withdrawal from the NATO-Russia border, consolidation at, uh, at a fewer number of storage sites, work in very interesting ways when you apply them to the Russian side. If you try to apply them reciprocally to the NATO side, though, it can be complicated, uh, given the fewer number of NATO storage sites. And, and if you talk about consolidating storage of American nuclear weapons in Europe, you're talking about probably reducing the number of countries that host weapons, which can cause some political questions for those who continue to have those weapons. Uh, so let me turn now. Those are, I think, two tracks that would get you to, I would argue, significant reductions, but would still leave the sides you know, comfortable that they had a force fully capable of defending their interests. Um, I think the big issue that has to be resolved before you get into any of this discussion, though, is missile defense, and I'll, and I'll talk just briefly about that. Uh, I am more optimistic about the possibilities on missile defense since the Pentagon made the decision to cancel phase four of the European phased adaptive approach. Because if you look at what the Russians have been complaining about for the last two years in missile defense, the focus has been phase four when they said the American SM-3 interceptor would have a capability against an ICBM warhead. Now, the Americans disagreed with that. The Pentagon said, no, the Russians have the physics wrong. That, that argument doesn't matter now because phase four has been canceled. So I, there's an opening here if the Russians would like to pick it up. Now, 
I would say the Russians are correct when they talk about the offense-defense relationship, and they are correct that if missile defenses increase in capability and number, at some point they could undermine the strategic offensive balance. And I would even go so far to say that I think the Russians are right that at some point you might need a legally binding treaty to constrain those. Uh, but I would argue that you don't need that now. Uh, and that's because the gap between offense and defense is so large. Uh, under New START, you have deployed 1,550 warheads. Even under what I'm talking about here, you go down to 1,000 deployed weapons. Uh, in 2017, uh, the United States will have at most 44 interceptors uh, capable of intercepting an intercontinental ballistic missile warhead. So I think with that large gap there, you can look at other things, uh, political commitments, transparency and such. And if you go back to some of the ideas that were reportedly discussed between the Pentagon and the Russian Ministry of Defense, there was a lot of convergence in their thinking back in 2011. So agreement on transparency, joint exercises, the idea that there would not be a single missile defense system, but there would be two independent systems with NATO retaining the decision to launch a NATO interceptor and Russia retaining command of the decision to launch a Russian interceptor. But those two systems would interact in a couple of jointly manned NATO-Russian centers. A data, rush, I'm sorry, a data fusion center that would take data from both sides, combine it, and then send the enhanced product back to both missile command centers. And then a planning and operations center where NATO and Russian military officers would meet regularly and talk about what sorts of threats they worry about, what sort of attack scenarios, some of their, uh, uh, their, their rules of engagement, how they would actually engage, so the sides can have an understanding basically about how the other side's going to operate. Uh, and it does seem to me that with the decision that was taken in, in, in uh, March on phase four, there's an opening here. And if the sides, in fact, can resolve differences on missile defense, A, it removes an obstacle to further nuclear reductions, but it would also, I think, open up a path for a cooperative data Russia missile defense system. Now, let me just talk very briefly about, I, mean, I, think, I think there's some big opportunities here. Uh, uh, and I, I try to be optimistic. Let me put in sort of the notes of realism. What, what are the challenges to those opportunities? And I'd say there are four. The biggest one is the Russians. Are the Russians ready to deal? And certainly if you look at what the Russians said publicly over the last two years, it's hard to be optimistic. Uh, but I always bear in mind somebody who spent a lot of time negotiating with the Russians says, you know, the Russians say no, 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 no until they say yes. And, and I would argue that the Russians actually have a couple of incentives to negotiate. Um, one is, I'll go back to um, the, this is the data exchange under the New START Treaty uh, in March of 2013. And what you see here is that Russia is already well under the limit on deployed strategic delivery vehicles and already is below the limit on deployed strategic warheads. Now, the U.S. military's force structure is such that over the life of the New START Treaty, the United States, without building any new missiles or bombers or submarines, is going to have no problem staying at 700 deployed strategic delivery vehicles and 1,550 deployed strategic warheads. If the Russians want to keep those numbers, first, I, I don't think the Russians are ever going to be able to get back to 700 delivery vehicles. But if they want to get back to 1,550 warheads, they're going to have to spend money building new missiles, particularly as they phase out SS-18 and SS-19 ICBMs, which are already past their service lives. So the Russians can make investments, and certainly the Russians will make some investments, but the Russians have an opportunity to moderate that investment if instead of building back up to 1,550, they would engage in a negotiation that would bring these numbers down. So I think that's, that's one incentive the Russians may have, particularly if the Russian economy does not perform as well as uh, expected, if, uh, if um, uh, the energy market uh, begins to get a little bit uh, uh, less tense and prices begin to fall. Uh, Mr. Putin may face himself face him, uh, a guns versus butter choice, and he actually may prefer butter in his current political circumstances. Uh, the second reason I think the Russians, and this goes back to this non-deployed uh, or reserve strategic warheads, is not only does the United States have a significant advantage in the numbers, but uh, as we see the Russians reducing, it appears that the Russians, when they reduce a missile, they take the missile out of service. The missiles that they keep in service probably have full warhead sets. Uh, that's not the case on the U.S. side. Uh, virtually all, if not all, American uh, missiles will be downloaded. So. Uh, the Trident submarine launch ballistic missile can carry eight warheads. Uh, under New START, it'll carry an average of somewhere four to five warheads. Now, it'll, that means it's going to have three to four empty spaces on it. Those extra warheads are going to go sit in a, in a storage area somewhere. If the treaty were to break down, the United States could return those four warheads to the active force. And, and by my calculation, I think we could add, or the United States could add, about a thousand 
deployed warheads to the force in a way that the Russians can't match for the foreseeable future. And I think that bothers some in the Russian military. Okay, that's one challenge. And I, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll see there. Second <coughs> challenge, I think, will be the allies uh, here. And, and the question comes, if we get any kind of agreement like the big treaty I outlined there, or even progress uh, along the two-track decision, at the end of the day, the Russians are going to insist all nuclear weapons have to be based on national territory. So the question will be for NATO is, will the change in circumstances that surround that kind of agreement be enough, or will there be other ways that NATO can assure those allies who want to see American nuclear weapons remaining in Europe so that they are prepared to accept the fact that the weapons would probably have to go home as a result of the U.S.-Russia agreement? The third challenge will be verification. Uh, when you move away from link, uh, monitoring warheads on large ICBMs and on, on submarines and talk about monitoring weapons in storage areas, uh, it's going to be a new challenge. It's not necessarily insurmountable, but the sides are going to have to deal with questions that they haven't had to deal with before. And while they may be able to come up with, I think, a pretty good regime for handling monitoring warheads in declared storage sites, there's the what about the rest of the country, when I think neither side at this point is ready to do any time, anywhere inspections. And then the final challenge for the American side on this is going to be the U.S. Senate. Uh, if, if President Obama wants to reflect these limitations, and reductions in an agreement. Uh, the question is, would the Senate be prepared to ratify? And I think that's a big question. Uh, and my, my, under, my sense is that the administration, therefore, is looking at options other than a treaty uh, that would not necessarily require going to the Senate uh, for approval. So I, I think that there are some opportunities out there, both in terms of further reductions and missile defense. I think there's a chance to seize them. And I would look at two things. What happens when President Obama and President Putin meet in June but perhaps more importantly, what happens when they meet the second time for a full-up summit on the margins of St. Petersburg in September? And I think that will give us indication whether we're going to make any real progress on these questions. Thanks. Steve, thanks very much. Thanks for talking to us about the opportunities with a note of optimism at the end. Let me ask uh, Ted Say to uh, give a commentary on that. Ted is a policy consultant with the British American Security Information Council, BASIC, uh, here in London. He recently wrote a monograph on the subject of arms control for the United Nations Association of the UK. Ted brought about a couple dozen of them along. It's on the table up here for those interested. Uh, uh, welcome to, uh, to take one. Ted, over to you. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to say um, it's an, a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm a member um, of the IISS, and this is my first time sitting up here at the table, and I'm enjoying the view, quite frankly, especially in the presence of, of so much experience with the U.S. Foreign Service. Um, Ambassador Pfeiffer served more than 25 years, Mark served 26, I served 26. Um, so if you're looking for a broad spectrum of, of viewpoints here, you're going to be sorely disappointed, I think. Um, I will say this, though. Uh, we're in the presence of an ambassador and deputy assistant secretary an acting deputy assistant secretary, and me. <laughs> <laughs> but I can make one claim to um, unique status in the U.S. Foreign Service. I am the only American officer from the State Department who's ever been published by Arms Control Today, Gridiron Strategy Magazine, and Wisden Cricket Monthly. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk that to you now, okay? Yeah. Yeah, we, we surrender. <laughs> so... Five minutes of reflection on, uh, on Steve Pfeiffer's thoughts, and I wanted to thank him, and I'm looking forward to reading his book as well, and I'm sorry I didn't bring a copy for autographing. Um, we are at a very, very interesting time, um, which you'll recall is an ancient Chinese curse, um, that you live in interesting times. We certainly are when it comes to arms control. Um, we have a re-elected U.S. president, who committed himself early on in his first administration to doing something meaningful in the field of nuclear disarmament and, and arms control. We have a political situation in the states post-2012 uh, elections where bipartisanship seems more distant than ever, and, and we are obviously light years away from the days when uh, a Senator Nunn on one side and a Senator Luger on the other could come together and do something extremely useful in the interest of not only the U.S., but international arms control and limitations in, in a meaningful way. Um, Senator Nunn, as you know, is retired, and Senator Luger got run out of his own party primary uh, this last year by a different faction. 
So the climate for support for meaningful, big-scale um, reductions would appear to be poor in Washington, and that's an important factor to keep in consideration. And then we have Moscow, where um, the most recent thing I've seen is uh, an American third secretary face down on the ground with uh, a security officer um, looming over him and, and accusing him of uh, espionage for heaven's sake, as though that ever happens. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing being trumped up for the evening news. And so a point being scored for domestic political consumption at the expense of a U.S. government which has just, as Ambassador Pfeiffer said, um, recently decided to do away with phase four of the European phased adaptive approach to missile defense, which was, I would have hoped, a fairly big um, sort of carrot to dangle in the direction of Moscow. Um, and, and there are some indications that it's being taken that way, or at least being considered as a, as a positive step by the U.S. administration. So to see this kind of knee-jerk, old-school, um, you know, we're going to toss one of yours in jail, and, you know, if, if you decide to retaliate, we'll make even more political hay when you do that. It, it's disappointing, in a sense, although not terribly surprising. But to the substance of, of this afternoon's discussion, there were some interesting points raised about where the opportunities are, even in the sort of political climate that I've touched on. Um, and I wanted to say just a couple of things, of, of points that jumped out at me, and I want to be brief because I, I agree with Mark Fitzpatrick. This really is about your interaction with Stephen Pfeiffer and the questions that will come up during that process. But um, reciprocity is uh, an important concept, clearly, in arms control and in, in confidence building, and, and this is a situation that, that screams out for, for more confidence. Uh, for some of the reasons I've touched on. But when you look at sort of knee-jerk mirror um, reciprocity, re reflexive, if you will, we do it so you have to do it or else it doesn't count, then you run into trouble. Because you've got a situation in Europe where there are um, what I still prefer to call theater nuclear weapons, because by my estimation any deliberate nuclear explosion has to have strategic impact. Um, you can't do reciprocity after about 200 weapons because that's all that NATO has. And that still leaves you with rather a large number on the other side. So any sort of one-for-one -one trade off isn't going to work. So reciprocity in this case has to mean that if we do something positive, we hope you do something positive too. And there are various possibilities for that, and all of them are to a greater or lesser extent fraught with their own problems. Um, frankly, to my mind, and, and this is speaking in a personal capacity only, I think the only meaningful step, given what uh, Steve Pfeiffer has said about the prospects for uh, a parallel track future negotiation, if at some point there is an agreement um, between the Russian Federation and the U.S. to do something about the numbers of uh, theater nuclear weapons in Europe, um, and given the fact that the Russians have not backed down on their insistence that these weapons be based in national territory, and I don't see any prospect for that precondition, which is what it is, to change, then to my mind, the way to make good things happen um, in Europe and bilaterally between the U.S. and the Russian Federation is for the removal of those some 200 theater nuclear weapons from Europe back to the continental United States and an insistence at that point on some kind of reciprocity on the part of the Russians. Now, obviously, removing 200 weapons on their part isn't going to do much good, as I said. So we'd be looking for different kinds of reciprocal action, some kind of positive um, step toward building greater confidence, something that NATO could accept as being in the spirit of uh, its call for reciprocity in previous years. Um, <clears throat> the Allies are crucial here, obviously. Um, and NATO processes are, to my mind, pretty much deadlocked in that there's a situation where without 28 Allies agreeing 
on change, there can be no change, um, given NATO's consensus-based organization. Um, one capital can hold up progress, and there is more than one capital that objects to the idea of the removal of U.S. theater nuclear weapons from Europe. So the idea that NATO as an organization is going to be able to make a change like that is, I think, mistaken. And I don't think there are too many people that are holding out hope for that at this point. And that leaves various other po possibilities, each of which is, is less palatable than the one before it. And what you look for in the end is either a decision by the U.S. government based on negotiations with the Russian Federation in which we basically say, we're doing this. And frankly, given a, even a cursory look at NATO's history, that's how things work in the alliance, whether we like it or not. Um, when the U.S. leads, things move. When it doesn't, things tend not to. Um, and I think at that point, I'll turn it over and uh, we can start questions. Thanks, Ted. This is, you know, talk about well-trained uh, speakers in the Foreign Service. They train you. you given 15 minutes, you, you do 15 minutes. Five minutes, you do five minutes. It leaves us, <laughs> leaves us half an hour for a good discussion. Uh, so let's, uh, I've got a couple, couple questions of my own, but let me turn to uh, uh, Mr. Kimura first of all, and then, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, in my view, Putin is very pragmatic leader, mm -hmm. and uh, he doesn't look at the United States, and uh, he looks at uh, China now, mm -hmm. I think. So how do you evaluate the possibility a Chinese nuclear force? They have a strategic nuclear weapon, uh, more than 200, and uh, you have 5,000. Okay. But uh, so I'm not sure uh, So Xi Jinping can change uh, his foreign policy and also military policy. And how do you evaluate the development of Chinese nuclear policy? Yeah. What, what, should we take these one yeah, at a okay. time? Yeah. yeah. For, for now, let's do that. Yeah. No, I, my, my impression is that China has been relatively modest in terms of its buildup and modernization of its forces, particularly its strategic forces, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, now, that's not a universally shared view in the United States. There, there are some in, in the United States who worry that if Russia and the United States come down too quickly, that China may, may build up. Uh, that's why I think that it would be useful for China, for example, now to take on a, a unilateral commitment not to increase. And it could, you could say, you know, as long as the United States and Russia are reducing, uh, not to increase. Now, now certainly I, th I think China figures very heavily in Russian calculations, although the Russians don't usually talk about that publicly. Uh, but I th would argue that you know, the numbers I'm throwing up here, you know, a 50 percent cut in Russian nuclear forces mm. still leaves them you know, six to seven times larger than the Chinese nuclear force. Uh, so that, that shouldn't alter that relationship in nuclear terms significantly between Moscow and Beijing. Good. I'm glad somebody asked the China question and, and well answered. Um, uh, Rachel Staley from, uh, from BASIC. Um, it seems like there are three major players involved, ignoring China for a minute, but the Russia, the U.S., and NATO allies. So who is the first to break here? Because um, the NATO allies are going to be a challenge if, if one of the concessions have to be the tactical nuclear weapons removing. So are they, and, and there's a deadlock within NATO, is it going to be NATO to break first, or is it going to be Russia? Who's going to make the first steps? And, um, and you gave us, a, Ambassador Piper, a timeline of 2015 that a, a, a treaty needs to hit the Senate. So is there enough time for all yeah. of this to happen? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm getting less confident that there is enough time to do that big treaty by 20. I mean, and, and that becomes a, a, a question for really the president. I mean, does he want to set in motion a process that would continue beyond 2017? You know, my, my sense is he would actually like to leave office having recorded something more beyond the new START treaty so that they may be looking at something else. Um, I would guess that, that you know, the, the first question there before you get into the hard questions within the alliance is, are, are the Russians prepared to do something on, on non-strategic nuclear weapons? Uh, you know, quite frankly, my, my impression in Washington, it, it, you have to look very hard in Washington to find somebody in the U.S. government will say, we need to keep American nuclear weapons in Europe for purposes of deterrence. What they do say is, we need to keep weapons in Europe because they play an important assurance role for those allies who still see the, that those weapons as signifying American commitment. 
Now, it would be my hope if you could get something like one of these treaties done. First of all, that presupposes, I think, also a change in the political life atmospherics. The question then becomes is the reductions in the numbers, because you would be telling you know, those allies who still worry about Russian tactical weapons you know, that this big treaty would cause the Russians probably to cut their uh, tactical weapons levels by 70 percent. So that, that's a positive step. Uh, and then could you come up with other non-nuclear ways to provide assurances? Are there things that you could do, exercises, contingency <coughs> planning? Uh, the United States Air Force now has a small detachment of about 30 people at a Polish air base. And that's a full-time detachment there 52 weeks a year. And they're there to support that once a year the squadron of American F-16s or C-130s will come in and exercise with their Polish Air Force counterparts. And after the exercise, the planes leave, but those 30 guys are still there. You know, that's, I mean, that, that's a way to provide assurance. So the question, I, what, I, you know, if the Russians are prepared to begin to take some reductions, but say you need to have the American weapons go home, can the Allies put together some things that ultimately make those Allies who right now see a need for those weapons say, okay, the circumstances have changed, we no longer see the weapons in Europe as a requirement, we can rely on American strategic weapons based in the U.S. for the nuclear guarantee. Thanks. Ted, you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, if I could. Um, there is a driver at work here which prevents the status quo at NATO from um, just sort of meandering along as, as I think the political leaders within NATO would hope could be the case. Um, you don't have agreement within NATO. Um, you've got disagreement which is masked by the consensus rule. There's no agreement to change, therefore there's no change. Um, but you've also got a clock ticking, two of them actually, one on the weapon itself, the B-61 nuclear gravity bomb, um, which is currently um, the subject of a, in, in today's economic climate, almost absurdly expensive life extension program, which is going to, I think, hit the rock sooner rather than later when all the other defense cuts start to kick in. Um, people are going to start questioning whether you really need a gold-plated tactical gravity bomb at this point. Um, especially in, against the backdrop of the kind of strategic triad decisions that Ambassador Pfeiffer is talking about. Does it really make sense to focus so much time, effort, and money on something which is of marginal military utility? And, and you know, what price political utility for NATO allies and assurance becomes the question at that point. But then the delivery vehicles as well, the, uh, the dual-capable aircraft are also aging, um, in some cases aging far more rapidly than their designers intended. And there are, again, expensive life extension programs underway right now to keep some of these things in the air right now. And so with the, the legacy systems getting very old very quickly, um, the German government, first and foremost, is going to have to make a decision. Do they spend more money to extend the life of their tornado fighter bombers further? And then the next question after that is how much money and for how much further? Um, is there any reasonable chance the German government will purchase the F-35, which is, at this point, is the only next-generation aircraft which is designated to be a replacement DCA? And given the problems that that system has had and the political climate in Germany, my guess is there is zero chance that the Germans will agree to purchase F-35 and only limited possibilities of them going much deeper in their pockets to pay for further life extensions for the tornado at which point Germany becomes a non-member of the DCA nations, and then the status quo is gone. And then you've got other repercussions to deal with uh, for the other four DCA host nations. So, yeah, Sorry, with the Belgians and the Dutch probably go right behind the Germans. I mean, I, I think this is the worrisome thing looking out for nuclear posture over NATO over 10 years, is you can see it falling apart, driven by unilateral decisions uh, that are already, I think, in motion. And so the question is, can NATO get ahead of that curve and, and try to get some arms control value for these weapons, you know, or at least uh, arrange for their withdrawal in a way where it's an alliance decision as opposed to just, you know, we stop flying the airplanes, therefore it makes no sense to have the bombs here. And by the way, these, uh, this discussion of theater and nuclear weapons that Ted just uh, uh, elaborated on is uh, right here in his, his publication. Uh, uh, Mark Smith from Wilton Park. really on, um, uh, is there an assurance challenge uh, among uh, 
US allies, and how much of a, a break do you think that is likely to put on domestic metaphors um, of ours growing before maneuver? Yeah. I think it was Danny Seeley during the Cold War who said that US nuclear weapons were, he said, 5% deterrent of the Soviet Union and not 5% assuring allies. Um, and when we discussed the nuclear posture issue at the Horton Park, one thing that has been a regular theme in discussions yeah. was that uh, US allies expressed strong concerns over future reductions and how far they could go before they began to regard their mm -hmm. security guarantees being generally eroded. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you, if you could um, share some reflections on how much you think that's going to limit the administration's room for maneuver and how it could be yeah. getting around. Okay. Well, I, I think first on the numbers, I, I think the numbers that we're talking about here, still 2,000 total nuclear weapons, 1,000 deployed strategic weapons, I, I think that's a pretty sizable number. And I don't think that number by itself would cause assurance problems with allies either in Europe or in Asia. I, I, as I said, I think the trickier question is, though, that if as a result of that agreement, you know, the Russians say, we're prepared to do this, which is a long shot, but I, I don't think that's impossible. I, I, I'm certain, though, the Russians would say nuclear weapons must be based on national territory. So then the challenge is, you know, not assuring allies with regards to the overall number as much as assuring European allies that their security can be protected, that they're under the nuclear umbrella, uh, but it would be provided by U.S.-based nuclear forces in the same way that it has been for American allies in Asia since uh, early, the early 1990s. But I think that's probably the trickier assurance question. And certainly... <laughs> That's one I think that Washington is very sensitive to. Uh, I, I think it, it probably is a, a rather small number of, if, if you took a flat poll now with the NATO, I think those countries who still see a need for weapons in Europe for deterrence purposes are in the minority. But the U.S. government, I think, is tries to be very careful not to sort of you know, run over those sensitivities. Thank you. Paul Schulte from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thank you. Two, two elegant um, uh, presentation and many of the things I was going to say have of course already been said, but that may not be a bad thing. Yeah. You, you've heard a number of people raise concerns about missile defense, about China, about allies, um, and all of those are part of the sort of meta question, yeah. is this doable? Yeah. It, it, it has the American administration the ability to overcome objections to yeah. in all those areas mm -hmm. in, in the necessary timescale. And yeah. I would add in also based on what the Russians were saying at yeah. the Warsaw mm -hmm. conference uh, about yeah. NSNWs, but it mm -hmm. widely, that they were concerned about advanced conventional systems, yeah. not mm -hmm. missile defense, yeah. and space. Yeah. So mm -hmm. those are two other areas where you would have to, yeah. or America would have to find deals, of, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. aspects of the deals that would satisfy Russia. Yeah. And the verification aspects would go further than sure. Russia had yeah. ever gone before. So that's, that's another yeah. area. So given all those problems, is, th is this very likely to have the, the, the yeah, yeah. elegant, successful, tidy um, histogram outcome that, that you did? And, and is the process likely to be somewhat destructive of confidence in itself? Because yeah. it will be the East Asians watching what will be portrayed as the crumbling of American will. You're willing to yeah. give up yeah. your promises in, in Europe to get this overall yeah. bilateral selfish deal. That's, there will be lobbyists saying sure, that, yeah. and that will echo around the world. So c couldn't this go rather wrong in a rather ugly way? Uh, yeah, I, but I, I think you've got to manage a lot of pieces very carefully. I, I will say, I mean, in order to be disciplined standard figures, there is PGS here, Precision Guided Systems, which was a point I did not mention. But I think you're right. I mean, the conventional, advanced conventional strike capabilities do bother the Russians. Although I would argue that you can break that problem down into pieces two of which have, I think, pretty apparent solutions, and, and one of which I think you could set on motion. And, and I would, for prompt global strike by conventional weapons, I, I'd say three areas. First is the question of conventional warheads on intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launch ballistic missiles. And New START addresses that. Yeah. If we put a conventional warhead on a Minuteman three, we take a nuclear weapon off. Uh, 1550 covers conventional as well as nuke weapons. The second area is the hypersonic glide vehicles, which both the United States and Russia are developing. And I think the Pentagon was correct when uh, the officials testified in the New START ratification debate that New START does not capture a hypersonic glide vehicle. Although it uses a ballistic missile to accelerate, it does not fly in a ballistic path. 
But I'm also pretty confident that if either side made progress towards a, a glide vehicle that could you know, put a weapon anywhere in the world in about an hour's time, it would occur to the other side that this pretty much replicates an ICBM. They would go to the Bilateral Consultative Commission set up by the New START Treaty, and that, that's one of the things that that body is designed to talk about is those sorts of uh, the development of new weapons. Uh, I would guess for the Obama administration, and this is just a guess, but I, I, I feel pretty comfortable in this. When they talk about the hypersonic glide vehicle, they talk about a niche capability. You know, we're not talking about large numbers. At the end of the day, you know, if, if these things, first of all, they have to be made to work. But if, if, if there was a real system, you know, I could see them extending the limits to cover that. The, the hardest question, I think, is what do you do about cruise missiles? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there is a concern that you encounter when you talk to Russian analysts who say, they're worried about the large numbers of American sea-launched and also air-launched conventionally armed cruise missiles, and, and they believe these pose a threat to Russian strategic forces. Um, and I actually think there's, th this is a question that the militaries ought to talk about. This is the kind of question you ought to put into a military-to-military -military channel. And one example being, a couple years ago I was in Moscow and heard some Russian experts say, yes, we're worried that you, you could use conventionally armed sea-launched cruise missiles to attack and destroy our ICBM silos. And just by chance, about two months later, I was out at uh, Omaha at a, at a symposium at Strategic Command, and I asked some fairly senior people there, and they kind of said, you know, we don't think so. I said, we, we could see why the Russians might be concerned if we put a conventional warhead on an ICBM just because of, of the velocity uh, and the force of the velocity. It, it would have a strong, uh, possibly a, a destroying or disabling the silo. They said, but they said cruise missile uh, warheads, six or 700 pounds of conventional, they, said they didn't think it would work. Now, that seems to me that's, an in, that's, that's a noble question. I mean, that's an engineering question. Hmm. And, and so you know, one of the things that uh, I would think, and, and this has actually been advocated, uh, again, by this track two process that Madeleine Albright and Igor Ivanov do to both governments is, you ought to have a military-to-military -military conversation. Say, what is the threat here? I mean, it, it, are, are these cruise missiles a real threat? And if you conclude they are, then what, then what can you do about them? But at least th there also may be a chance that you may conclude the end they, that they don't have that much in, impact on the strategic balance. So I, I, I think I, I talked about re nuclear reductions and missile defense. I, there's other pieces that you have to have, and I think conventional. But I think you can handle conventional in various ways. That, that shouldn't uh, be uh, beyond the unimaginable. Well, that was certainly flagged down as a confidence building measure, a long list. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. But it was a long list that the Russian experts said the Russian government had absolutely no interest in taking forward unless it was yeah. an absolute reward well, for the well, And this gets back to the question I mean, you know, if the Russians don't want to do a deal, the Russians will come up with lots of reasons, linkages for not doing a deal. And, and I think that's, you know, that'll become apparent in the next, uh, in the next two meetings between the two presidents. I, I think it's a little bit opt I find a little bit of reason for optimism is that if you look what the Russians have said in the five weeks since uh, uh, National Security Advisor Donlin went, mm. they've become much more measured in, 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 in their public pronouncements. I was three weeks ago in Geneva on a panel with um, uh, Deputy Defense Minister Antonov, and he can be sometimes fairly negative, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, fairly pessimistic. Uh, he, he was clearly, though, on very good behavior and, and, and was leaving doors open. So, you know, I may be reading too much into that, but I think that there's some opportunities to explore and see if they can't get something going. But we'll see in September. Ted, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I would like to. Um, I think conventional is a very important part of the overall mix. And I think there's a specific European component to conventional arms control, but one I think that necessarily has to be multilateral. I don't think it's going to be soluble in a bilateral channel, and I don't think we should try. Um, I think CFE was a noble endeavor. Its time has come and gone. Um, the, the nuts and bolts of CFE are no longer useful, but um, both the letter of sort of openness and verification and transparency, and more importantly, the spirit of what that achieved beyond just reductions in TLE in the five categories, um, are what we need to try and carry forward. But the challenge here is to try and capture precision guidance in a meaningful way that will help people accept the need for and the utility of conventional arms control in Europe. And that's, I don't know that we've seen answers to that question. How do you do that? But that's, I think, what needs to be done. I think that's the missing bit right now in proposals to come up with something to replace CFE. If it doesn't capture precision guidance, it's not really going to capture Russian interests, I don't think. Thank you. Uh, Desmond Bowen, who um, 
is the uh, 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 an advisor with the uh, UN Secretary General's Board on Disarmament Matters and formerly with the Defense Ministry. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. Can I just um, ask a question and ask you to comment on the linkage um, through to the NPT um, and, um, and seeing that the um, uh, prep comms are now starting, the one recently in Geneva with a not so happy outcome of the Egyptians, I think, walking out. I mean, this um, very much is a bilateral focus. Um, I mean, how does this link into the well-being and longevity of the um, of the NPT? I mean, is there is there a sort of sense and understanding both in um, Russia and in the U.S. that there are expectations um, on the part of the wider community and actually a real interest on the part of there's two leading nations in the NPT continuing in being and being useful. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say in Washington, a there, there is definitely seen lots of value in continuing the NPT regime, uh, even while recognizing that it's under a lot of stress now, and and two, I think recognition that uh, it would be very useful for the United States and, and Russia to be seen as doing something more beyond New START between now and 2015 to have, an, as a, possible, to have a positive outcome for the uh, review conference. So I, I think that means they would like to get something more going in terms of U.S.-Russia reductions. Uh, second, uh, if you go back to um, the limits, the, the limits uh, on New START don't kick in until 2018. There are, I think, some technical reasons. It'll be hard, for example, to implement the 800 limit on launchers because you have to come up with a way for disabling or what they call detubing uh, for the missile tubes on each side, basically rendering the tubes incapable of launching a ballistic missile. And they want to do that in a regular cycle as the submarines go into the dockyards. So that may take time. But, but there's no reason why they couldn't accelerate the implementation of the 1550 limit. I mean, if we've decided now, if the U.S. military has concluded that 1,550 warheads will be sufficient for American national security in 2018, it ought to suffice today because if you look at it in uncertainty in the next four years, it, you plan it's only going to get worse, not better. Uh, and you could take warheads off of missiles, uh, even if you had to leave the missiles in the silos. It, it would be unusual to have a deployed ICBM with no warheads, but it's not prohibited by the New START Treaty, and the New START Treaty would allow the Russians to inspect. So I, I, and I, th I think that kind of idea, I, I think people in Washington are thinking that that might be one gesture they could make is accelerate implementation, particularly of the warhead limit. And then the third area is in this, in this P5 discussion that's now going on, which is starting off with baby steps, working on now what's the terminology. Uh, but this is one where I would think that there's an opportunity for Washington and Moscow to begin to push the other three, okay, to say, look, nuclear reductions cannot forever just be a U.S.-Russia only exercise. And, and can you edge the other members of the P5 and then perhaps other nuclear weapon states to begin to do some things like transparency, to begin taking the baby steps, and like I said, perhaps even making a unilateral commitment not to build up as long as the United States and Russia are reducing. So those are things that could be done. I, they won't always be easy to do, but that you know, might set the stage for a more positive outcome from an American point of view in 2015 in, in terms of allowing the United States to demonstrate uh, uh, implementation of its uh, commitments under the NPT. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, time is... Uh, just a quick question. What's the incentive for Russia and the U.S. to reduce nuclear uh, arms when uh, North Korea, rumors of North Korea and uh, Iran yeah. um, are developing? Uh, I'd divide those problems out. If we implemented that big treaty that we had tomorrow, We'd still have 200 times as many nuclear weapons as North Korea, <laughs> so I, I don't I don't think that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> the, the numbers the numbers are <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you, you, and I would argue, I mean, incentives. I mean, I, I think that there are cost reasons to reduce. Money, but money's a big, money's a big reason, and it's becoming a big reason on the U.S. side. It was we were talking about at lunch. It's interesting. Uh, the uh, commander of Strategic Command was talking the other day about the number of new ballistic missile submarines we might buy for the U.S. Navy, and that's been 12, 12, 12, 12. But if you look at his testimony. He was leaving room to go below 12 because I think they realized that building 12 submarines basically means a lot fewer destroyers and cruisers. Uh, so money, I think there's also a recognition in Washington that the extent that the United States and Russia are reducing, it does make it easier for those countries to go to third countries and say, don't build up. And now, that's not going to cause a change overnight in North Korea or Iran, uh, but I think it works with other countries. I mean, I, I don't think it's necessarily a coincidence that since 20. 10 when the New START Treaty has been signed, 
the United States has had much greater luck in terms of encouraging other sta states to impose you know, fairly heavy financial and economic sanctions on Iran. So I, I think there's that advantage in terms of strengthening non-proliferation credentials. So there are, there are reasons in Washington and I think also in Moscow. I've still got four people on my list, so let's take uh, them groups of two. Uh, the two gentlemen in the uh, third row and the second row. Um, Martin Butcher. Was Martin, Martin, sorry, yes, Martin. Martin. Yeah, um, on optimism, you said, I think, Steve, you're, you're less optimistic maybe now than when you finished the yep. book. Um, and I, I was really struck seeing overnight um, Joe Serencioni, you know, has been relentlessly positive in public at least yeah. about the administration and, it, and its goals in it, um, saying that he thought the president has in some ways lost control of the administration on this issue and that the, 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 the proposed increase in the um, weapons budget with the proposed decrease in the proliferation mm -hmm. uh, areas of the budget just look bad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the, a, a real grip needs to be taken on this by the White House. So, with that as background, I guess. Let's take. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's take uh, also, your, sir, your question. Yes, yeah, so my, my question originally was going to be on conventional weapons, which has sort of been dealt with. But I actually, thinking about the, you know, the start process, I just wondered if you saw any scope for trying to push for demerging of missiles, which was part of the aborted Star II treaty. Okay. Yeah. Can you take both of those? Sure. Uh, on the on the demerving, um, well, I mean, the U.S. is already, as a matter of unilateral policy, doing a lot on demerving. So the ICBM force will be completely down to single warhead missiles. Um, I think, in terms of going back to something that was in uh, Start Two about actually banning MIRVs, my guess is that would be really hard. And, and and they did not pursue that in negotiation of the new Start Treaty because they said, you know it would require so much negotiating capital that it would, they would rather use their negotiating capital on other things. So, so my sense is that, that, that there, you're, you're unlikely to see that, a hard push on that, although certainly I think the sides are going to look at ways to reduce the uh, w ratio of uh, warheads to uh, missiles. Uh, I'm less optimistic, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm less optimistic just with the passage of time because, you know, I, ideally, I, I think the Russians were in a holding pattern until the election. Uh, you know what? What I the, the Russians though then you know sort of kept in a holding pattern. So that that makes me a bit op less optimistic uh, then. On, on uh, the White House and the president, I mean, uh, I would be hesitant to say that the White House has lost control. But this because this is an administration on foreign policy questions where the White House pretty much holds reins pretty tightly. But but there is one question that 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 people are asking, and that is the nuclear posture review implementation study. Mm -hmm which was launched in, I think, August or September of 2011 as a 90-day study. Yeah. And the 90 days kept moving back. Now, my, my own guess is, no one's told me this, but my guess is that in May or June last year, a command decision was made, we're not going to show the study to the president until after the election. Because if he checks a box, the word will leak out, and it could play in a way that would be negative both for the election, but also negative for arms control. Uh, what I guess people are kind of beginning to wonder, scratch heads, okay, the election's behind us now, you know, why hasn't that box been checked? And I, I don't know whether there's a congressional angle to it or whether there's a rush angle to it, but I, I think that's what's causing some questioning, is, is the president really has the opportunity in that implementation study, and we'll never see the results of it, uh, because it'll be highly classified, but he, it's, it's his opportunity to tell the military, if we have to use nuclear weapons, this is what you need to accomplish. Uh, and if he if if he decides that sort of damage expectancies can be less in the past, you know that can be a way to drive down American numbers. Uh, but uh, for some reason, he hasn't yet checked that box. Uh, Steve, I know you have another appointment. Uh, do we have do we have a little bit more? We won't take fifteen. Usually, we try to keep these uh, to one hour. But I, I did uh, recognize uh, two people. I'm going to add a third. So um, uh, Heather Williams, uh, uh, John uh, Simpson, and then the young lady in the first row. So, Heather? Hi, thanks. Um, my question was about Russian willingness to engage in arms control, which you've been touching on. And just yesterday, the House Armed Services Committee said it would not approve <laughs> funding for new START implementation in the coming year unless they get this study and whatnot. And so, I'm just curious, are you getting any sense of how the Russians are reading this? And is the U.S., the situation of the U.S. Congress, is that hurting U.S. credibility? to engage in any future uh, negotiations with Russia. Hold that thought. Okay. John? Um, 
my question really is about the elephants in the room, or perhaps they should be the fleas in the room, mm. and that's the United Kingdom and France. Um, in Salt, way back, the Russians made a very big push to have uh, those forces included with the American forces. And eventually, it was resolved by the Russians making unilateral statements as to what they would do if certain things happened. I wonder if you can offer us some thoughts on quite what the inter interrelationship is, or will be in future, between the UK and the French forces on the one hand, mm. and uh, the Russians on the other, uh, especially given the fact that their forces together are considerably more than the 200 nuclear weapons, mm. that's American nuclear weapons in Europe. Two good questions. We'll take uh, the last one. If you could identify yourself, please. Yes, uh, Stop Troll from the English Network. Um, very short. On uh, the verification regimes, you start in missile defense. Uh, you've mentioned briefly that um, New START's reductions are not so substantial, but the verification regime has been successful. And I was wondering if you could tell us uh, your thoughts on how likely or is it possible that this successful uh, verification regime of New START could be applied into missile defense um, negotiations. Okay. Um, uh, Ted, you want to? Okay, Steve, you're the, you're the star here, so okay. you take these, and then Ted, if you want to say anything at the end. Thank you. Okay. Well, first, uh, Congress. Um, yeah, that, that, I, I, we, in fact, we, we talked about that report over lunch, uh, and that's, uh, there's a really interesting constitutional question here, because New START was approved for ratification by the Senate. Uh, treaties once approved by the Senate have the, four, they are the law of the land. So you have one congressman suggesting that he will not fund money necessary to comply with the law of the land. Uh, so I, th there may be some White House lawyers who have a different view on what he can actually do on that. Uh, I don't know how that plays out. Uh, I th I th the Russians look at this, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I'm not, sometimes uh, I think the Russians don't fully understand the sometimes contentious relationship between the White House and the Congress. I, mean, I, I think there are many people in Moscow, for example, who believe that the Magnitsky bill was orchestrated by the Obama administration or supported by the Obama administration when I think it was very clear that the Obama administration you know, saw this as an obstacle, a problem, and still lost on it. So I, I, I'm not sure how that feeds into <coughs> Moscow when they read a report like this. On the question of Britain and France, uh, Again, I, I think the United States and Russia could do one more bilateral negotiation. But if we got this big treaty, 2,000 weapons, 1,000 deployed weapons, mm. I, I think the next step has to be a multilateral negotiation where you, you at least bring in Britain, France, and China in some way. Uh, and, and at least, and then part of that's based on because I, I've had Russian analysts say that they could not see Moscow ever going below 1,000 deployed warheads without some kind of limitation regime that it covers at least Britain, France, and China. So. I'm trying to leave them on the side for now, but you know, if we get this the next step, uh, they need to come to the table. Uh, on the uh, verification measures, um, the U.S. Senate would not like that question, or at least the Republicans in the Senate would not like that question because they don't like the idea of any limits on missile defense. But I think that there are things that you could do on transparency with regards to missile defense. And it was interesting, about two years ago, uh, the then head of the uh, Missile Defense Agency said he would be prepared to give the Russians advance notice when he was doing tests of SM-3 interceptors and allow Russian experts to come and even with Russian equipment to monitor the tests. The idea being that the Russians could then monitor the velocity and the range of the SM-3 interceptor and he said they would then conclude that this missile does not have either the speed or the range to have any prospect of engaging an ICBM. Uh, that hasn't been taken off the table as far as I'm aware. Now there, there was a discussion last week in, in Congress uh, Congress, uh, or at least some on the Republican side of Congress, are very opposed to the idea of sharing any classified data with Russia. <coughs> and uh, the Pentagon uh, representatives were asked, have you, have you shared this data? And they said no. Uh, the head of the Missile Defense Agency did say, I have had conversations with others in the Pentagon about you know, what data you might declassify. He said, we haven't declassified the data yet. But, but at some point, you know, we may have to face a tough question on the American side, which is, 
you know, does it make sense to declassify certain data about American missile defense capabilities if declassifying that and sharing that with the Russians would be useful in persuading the Russians that these interceptors, in fact, are designed to deal with shorter range systems or they don't have the capabilities to be a threat to Russian systems? Uh, and I think that, that may be a fight between the administration and Congress, but uh, uh, you know, it, may, it, may, it may be a fight that you need to have if you want to resolve the, uh, the question of, um, of um, missile defense. There's one other idea, I think, out there on missile defense, um, which Mike and I have pushed, is uh, the United States could, and, and you could actually do this, I think, without going too much into classified, but you can get this from budget documents. You could tell the Russians, we're going to give you a, a declaration every year that will take each major component of American missile defenses. SM-3 interceptors, Block 1A, Block 1B, Block 2A, you know, radars, ground-based interceptors, and they'll say, this is the number we have now. This is the maximum number we'll have each year for the next 10 years looking out. And, and you can get some of this already from congressional budget documents. <coughs> Package it that way, then say, and we won't change those numbers without advance notice. And what that gives the Russians is a pretty full an annually updated picture of American missile defense capabilities against which they can do the calculation. Is that a threat to their forces or not? So there are some transparency things I think that could be done which might not run a uh, foul of classification issues where the United States might be able to provide some assurance to Russia that it would either not face a threat to its strategic forces or would have plenty of time to say there's a problem and then take you know whatever action it felt was necessary. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ted. Thank you all for your questions and commentary. Um, this discussion has all been uh, recorded uh, and will be on our, uh, our website. Uh, apologies to the listeners for that long fire alarm uh, from the neighbors uh, in the back, the British American Tobacco Association. Uh, um, and uh, yes, uh, please join me in thanking the speakers for what I think was a stimulating discussion on next steps in arms control.